I'm going to stay on a few verses today. So if you want to first open your Bibles, uh, Psalm 91, and uh, really my focus today will be on verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. I really want to take the time today to just be slow and still through this. And the first thing I would like to do is I would like to show you, without giving you a tedious lesson in uh, Hebrew, I would like to show you what the Hebrew looks like. Um, we'll put this here, Psalm 91 and verse 11. And I want us to just take a little time here, the key Hebrew, key, four, and this word here is part of the ending of the word angels. So for or because his angels. And this is strange. Um, in your King James it says, charge over thee, which is, we're going to explain what that really means. I think you're going to be surprised. So um, he, and we're going to put charge just like that for a minute. You know when I do that, there's going to be something there. To you, um, to, to watch, and I'm going to put that in quotes as well, to watch, to watch you um, in Bekal, in all uh, the Raki, uh, ways of you. So that's what it looks like. Now the reason why I'm doing this is I want to, I first want to start talking a little bit piece by piece. Let's first start with his angels. You know, I think unless you're looking in the Bible for something, unless you're really looking, you may, you may just go right over it. Um, how many of you ever noticed this? You, I don't know, you you get a, a car, uh, your car is red, suddenly you notice there's a lot of red cars on the road. You ever have that experience? Suddenly there's a lot of something that you have paid attention to. Well, as I went through the scriptures on the subject of his angels, I actually thought, how could a person read through the Bible and not see how laden down with angelic presence and messengers from the simplest beginnings Strangely enough, uh, in Genesis, and I, I began to chronicle through the Bible, uh, putting aside for a minute the record of the garden, and you have so many appearances. Uh, Abraham's one of them that just, I mean, talk about a guy who has lots of luck or whatever he had because he had multiple appearances, and they appeared to him, and they spoke to him. Um, today, they would probably put him away, but it actually <laughs> happened like that. Um, we know that in Genesis 18, he has a conversation with the angels. In fact, I've made a whole uh, a list of them, and they're staggering. If you have time in your own time, just look in the book of Genesis how many angelic appearances and references. But in Genesis 18, that's where the three men on the plain of Mamre occur, appear to him. Sarah's in the tent. They say, Sarah's going to have a child. She laughs. We, we always assume that one person, that single man, we know should be a Christophany, if we're rightly interpreting, but there were two other people. They were angelic hosts along with this third person. Uh, again, in Genesis 22, I've often referenced when Abraham's going up the hill to offer Isaac. And I think I have made a picture version rather than what the scripture says, because the angel spoke. The angel didn't stay his arm. The angel spoke to him and said, now that I know, you don't have to. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw that the Lord had provided a ram instead of sacrificing his son. And as you keep going through the Bible, you think, wow, uh, Jacob, multiple times. And in fact, Jacob's multiple times, some of them were in dreams, some of them were the reality, the real presence all the way to the end of Genesis where when he's blessing the children of Israel, he says, and the angel that redeemed my life. Then you travel into Exodus. I mean, I'm giving you this idea that in your spare time, start looking up how many times you read about the angel, the angel of the Lord, 
the cherubim, the seraphim, you, you, you almost have to say, you know, if you're not looking, you can go right by these. Just like when Moses is going to that bush that wasn't consumed, it was, it was the angel of the Lord that spoke to him out of that bush. Hey, Moses, not hey you, hey Moses, come here. And on and on and on and on. So why wouldn't we? Um, and I'm not saying that most of us don't, but why wouldn't we kind of discredit all that and say, oh, come on, that's, that happened for these people. But, you know, when you keep traveling through those appearances, they are not limited to the Old Testament. I mean, I think of all the things I've chronicled in the New Testament regarding his angels. I referenced last week in the temptation of Christ, as Satan departed, the angels came and ministered. I think about the announcement of the birth of John the Baptist to Zacharias and the announcement to Mary that she's going to have a child, both by angelic voices. The angels announcing to the shepherds in the field. The angels, I mean, you can keep going on and on and on and on. I want to drive home a point to where you go, I, I get it. I think, especially coming out of my background, I've always been, uh, I steer away from some things that might appear to be uh, slightly maybe mystical. You want to steer clear from those to keep a solid, pivotal, uh, what is founded in this word. But then as I'm reading, I'm thinking, you know, there isn't, there isn't anything mystical about this. These are God's messengers, his mouthpieces, his encouragers, even to Christ. Not just after the temptation, but in the garden. It says in Luke's gospel that an angel came to minister to him. You read about all of these things we take for granted. At the resurrection, the empty tomb, the angels were there. At the ascension of Christ, the angels were there. Paul talks about how, in Acts 27, how the Lord, an angel of the Lord, stood by him. How an angel deli delivered Peter out of the prison. So almost every single book and every single speaker is speaking of some angelic host. And at some point you have to say, if you believe in these forces that are around us, we speak a lot about the prince of the power, the air, principalities, dominions, these rulers, these dark forces. You must also believe that God has assigned his angels to you. you know, not somebody else. To you. And that's the beginning of really grabbing hold of this, is we can read this psalm and keep it in mere poetry and prose. Or we can really wrap our mind around how much, and I'm not into angelology, but how much God put value on these uh, encouragers. Clear through to the book of Revelation. In fact, the book of Revelation is so laden down with angelic beings. Seven angels, 12 angels. You find them around the throne, praising and saying, worthy is the Lamb. Both John on the Isle of Patmos and Daniel saw Angel, angels appear before them. Their appearance, bright, brilliant, uh, terror-stricken, both of these men fell to the ground. In one case, and in fact, I love Daniel's account because it says that God sent an angel to shut the lion's mouth. I want that angel. <laughs> you want that angel? I want that angel. But you read all of these diverse concepts of what these angels look like. Ezekiel 28 talks about before Satan fell, how beautiful, we, we can't even imagine how beautiful he must have been before he fell. Ezekiel 28 talks about his pipes and his tablets, the beauty of what must have been, and I'm sure he knew it too. We have a depiction of when angels appear and sometimes referred to in other places, a different being with multiple arms, seraphims, sometimes winged, cherubims. You know, we don't know, we cannot know, unless we know what we've, we've read from the Bible. We don't know what these beings really look like, the, the glory of them. And I believe this, those that are still in their first estate that did not fall, they are so glorious and so radiant that this is why both Daniel and John, in, in seeing them, it was so bright. The light was so brilliant. They, were, they are God's light. So if you 
are following me, we've got other pictures of angels as well. We've obviously got fallen angels and the foremost one we encounter in the garden. And I think in painting this picture and trying to give an idea through the Bible, usually, usually, the angels come to make an announcement, usually some good news announcement, but sometimes they come as one angel, one angel, spoke in reaction to something that was happening to God's people, and 185,000 people were killed by one angel. In another place, it talks about when David sinned and he numbered the people, and 70,000 people from Dan to Bathsheba were killed, one angel. So when you talk about force, we don't understand even the force or the power. Now, hang everything I've said, every, just don't turn, I'll read you something. Hang everything I've said on this one verse. I'm not even going to tell you where I'm turning because I don't want you to leave where you are. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So you get the idea that, and by the way, that was Colossians 1.16. <laughs> you get the idea that God created these beings to be ministering assistance, if you will. And they do just that. So it, it should come as no surprise when we try to tackle Psalm 91, and we're, we're talking about his angels. I want to get rid of the caricature I want to try and empty our minds of things that we've seen that, oh, well, isn't that cute? I think if we actually saw the angels protecting us, if, if they appeared to us, I think it would scare the liver out of us. That's what I think. I mean, based on John and Daniel's reaction. So, invisible as they are, but the more I'm reading this, the more I'm recognizing God in his kindness to us in his mercy to us, that because we have made God our stay, I go back to verse 2. Verse 2 says simply, I will say to the Lord, my refuge, my fortress, my God, in him will I trust. Because God has seen where I have anchored myself, he dispatches, he sends his angels. Now, sometimes, as you know, if you were studying this word in the Hebrew for angel, you'd recognize that it looks a lot like the name of Malachi. It looks a lot like the root of these three consonants for king, kingdom. I showed you that on festival out of the lexicon. So don't make these angels, don't reduce them down to what you think they might be. Powerful, strength. In fact, there's one psalm that talks about their mighty strength. The Apostle Paul talks about the mighty angels, the dunamis angels. So I want you to kind of get the picture. This is not some fluffy spa massage we're going to encounter here. These are real, powerful, invisible beings that surround us. Now having said that, let's go back to this for a minute. So, for because his angels, he, he being God, and this is the one I want to stop at. Strange way to look at this word, but it's a, it's a ew, charge. Now, when I think of that, I think of commission. I think of, uh, hey, you guys over there, go, go get that one. Kind of like that. And it's kind of like that, except I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the essence of what it really implies. Go, if you will, to uh, Genesis. And uh, in the book of Genesis, we know that God commanded in uh, Genesis 2.16 and then also in chapter 3, we'll read, The Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, 
thou shalt surely die. Now I want you to see that word that's in there in verse 16, the Lord God commanded. You all see that word? That is the same word. I want you to get a feel for this. That is the same Hebrew word that's appearing right here. So I want you to get the idea, and this will go straight through the Bible, by the way. In fact, I'm going to do this now. How many of you have read parts of the Bible where you read the word command or commandment, and you go, oh, don't know what to do with that? Show me hands. Come on, honesty time. Yeah, good. Because I've said many times, English has a limited frame, and certainly with the translators doing what they did, you might confuse the fact that there was no law. We have a commandment from God here that's not part of the law, but it was the spoken covenant of God to Adam. Again, in Genesis, God said to Noah, don't turn there. I want to stay in, in Genesis 2 and 3. But God said to Noah, he commanded him to build an ark. He didn't say, Noah, it's God. <laughs> it's the law speaking. He commanded him. And Noah, in his obedience to hearing the voice of God, built that ark, although he had never seen a flood before. And you can keep traveling down this road of the command of God. And you find that it should not jar your mind at all to think that we have made a terrible mistake when we translated the word commandments of God, the Ten Commandments, and a command of God. They're two separate and distinct Hebrew words. They kind of even look a little bit the same, but they're, they're separate and distinct. So I want you to catch the picture that this word, which we're reading in our King James charge, really carries with it a command. And although this appears simplistic, it's something quite profound because if Noah, for example, had not been obedient to God and not built the ark, he too would have perished. So when God speaks a thing, we get a record of those who obeyed God's word, who carried forth, who listened to God's commandment obediently and did, and therefore, because God gave his word and he's not a man to lie. And then we have, in Genesis, we have God telling Adam, about that tree. You have dominion over everything, Adam. And everything in this garden except for that one tree, don't touch it. Now, I want you to really think about this because this is, it's one of those moments where when I'm reading this, I'm thinking, you know, Satan is not only the worst liar, but he's so conniving because he tries to do these subtle twists on us in the garden when Satan, when Chapter 3, when the serpent appears and says, did God really say? God just said. Remember last week I said to you, after Jesus came out of the water, we heard the voice through the scriptures, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. If thou be the son of God. God spoke in the garden. Don't you think the serpent was around? God spoke and said, everything, Adam, is yours, except for that one tree. Here is the most subtle creature, comes along and says, did, did God really say that? You can always know the voice of Satan when it is to doubt, and clearly what we have had revealed to us through his word. But there's something more. After this disobedience and after the fall, and after the punishment that is meted out to both Adam and Eve to be put out of the, the garden to have to work, can you imagine that? You can all thank Adam that you have to go out and work. All right, you may not think that's really a big deal, but if you read carefully for the women, we have that pain of childbirth, and for, for you men and women, you've got to go out there and sweat on your brow. So, you know, when you get to heaven, <laughs> you better move out of my way. <laughs> All right. 
In Genesis 3, at the very close, when they are exposed out of the garden, it says that God drove out the man. He placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, no matter what I do today, if you'll do one thing, which is to remember God gave a commandment, gave them the liberty of everything except for that one tree. Had they obeyed, had they obeyed. And I, that's why I use the juxtaposition of Noah, because Noah obeyed and he lived. So you start to get the idea through this that God places his cherubim, a noteworthy concept. He, he, by the way, he could have placed anything, a seraphim, an angel, but he placed a cherubim there to keep the way. And I find it interesting because most of the time when we encounter cherubims in the scripture, they are a type of heavenly things. They are protecting heavenly things. We know that from the Ark of the Covenant where the cherubim are with wings extended, protecting that covering, the mercy seat, where the priest would go in every year to sprinkle the blood, and if it was acceptable, he would live. I wouldn't want that job either. But I just want you to take notice of something. The cherubim was, cherubims, plural, were put there to keep the way of the tree of life. Back in our psalm, we have his angels that he's given a command. He's commanded them. He, doesn't, he hasn't said, oh, little brotherly angel creature beings, would you please? He gives them a command. That's what that word is saying to you. So when you, when you read this next time, it's okay to read charge as long as you keep in the back of your mind that what it's really saying is just as God commanded Adam and just as God commanded Noah and just as God commanded Moses before the law regarding the children of Israel, he's commanded his angels to you. Not some question asking possibility, a command. And they are given command to you to watch in all your ways. Now, if you'll indulge me, I hope you're still on Genesis 3.24. And you'll see in Genesis 3.24 where it says to keep the way of the tree of life. To keep, same word, and ways. And I thought, you know, that's kind of interesting that angels are helping us to stay in the way. And I mean in his way. In this case, God had to place that, those beings there to protect from Adam going back to eat of the tree of life, which would have given them life eternal, and they would have stayed eternally in the state, in the fallen state, never getting to the estate that God then promised through the promise of the seed of the woman. So a lot of stuff I'm putting out here, but I'm going to bring it all back to you in a minute. Let's kind of take all the thoughts I've just put out there, and let's add one more fray here, one more idea. When it says he will give command to you, his angels, I want you to think of the audacity of Satan that when he came to Jesus to tempt him, he gave him a commandment. He didn't, he didn't say, kindly, would you kindly please? The Greek reads unambiguously as the translators have placed it for us as an imperative. Turn these stones or this stone to bread. I think about the audacity when you talk about an angel of light using this very subtle thing that he knew the promise right here. He's going to quote it to Jesus. His angels command over you. But I'm still an angel. You omit the fact, Satan, that you're fallen. I'm still an angel. I got power. Corrupt. Deceptive. Now you think about this. When I said to you, what would have motivated Satan to reach in here and use this was not only the things we covered last week, but talk about the ultimate twisting of Scripture, about his angels getting command. And he appears and says, essentially, I, I, I command you to do this. This is why you can always 
see and hear and recognize people who don't know scripture will be the easiest ones to sucker into some trick because it sounds so plausible. You know the saying, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is? It is. That's what I said. So, let's take a second look at this. For he, here we have his angels, and he, God, is given command. Let's write that here. Command. The same command, as I said, to Noah, the same command to Moses, the same command to, uh, in fact, let me draw a line down here and say this. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament and Apocrypha, that this word, which the Hebrew is using here, tzadi, vav, he, is being translated in the Septuagint, entole. I spelt it phonetically for you. You know how charming that is? Because when I read about Jesus, this is a free sidebar for a minute here. When I read about Jesus in John 14 and 15, when he says, I give you a new commandment, I give you a new command, you know what I'm saying? He says that you love one another. He's using that word. And I thought, you know, this is why we read through these concepts. And it's only because John, the apostle of love, gives us the ability to understand what these new commandments are. The other writers didn't help us much. But when Jesus talks about a new commandment, he's not saying, thus saith the Lord and the Ten Commandments and the prophets. He's saying a command given by God, just like the same command given to Adam in the garden, to Noah, to build the ark. Now Jesus speaks to us through John's gospel, giving us instruction. That's why it's not open to discussion. People say, but I, I don't want to love anybody. I just, you know, I, I hate everybody. I'm just miserable and I like it. Leave me alone. Christ is in you, you will be changed. It may not happen in, in a year, it may not happen in five years, it may not happen in ten years, but at some point you will be changed. And the commandment no longer becomes some ordinance and some I gotta do this, but it's what lives inside of you now. So I'm looking at all of this and I'm thinking, wow, God, God's really good. I love all this. In fact, I'll tell you how much I love all this. I found as many translations as I could. I won't bore you with them, except to say, let me go to our next page here. Wow, those are all the Latin things I could find. I don't expect you to read Latin. Extremely frustrating when everything ends in is and bus. <laughs> but the one thing that I would like you to see as we're going through, and this is Psalm 91 and verse 11, I want you to see one word as I gave you the English concept of charge and command. The Latin has many variations, but one word consistently through all these diverse translations reappeared. Custodiant, 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 custodiant. We get our English word, custody. And I thought, even though that misses the concept of command, it certainly conveys the idea that God has given his angels a command, go, watch, an invisible custody. Now, there, it's contingent. This is, this is not like, oh, I think now that you understand this, you're in, we're all saved, come on, let's go. It means while you're in verse 2, while you remain the house of God, while you keep the faith, while you remain in Christ, he's given this inv invisible host custody over you. Now, don't you think, Pastor, I'm a little bit old to have somebody have custody of me? God doesn't think so because he knows how messed up you are, right? Doesn't think so. Well, back to verse 11. To give you a little picture words, for because his angels, he commands to you to watch you. Now this Hebrew word, I'll share a secret with you. When uh, Wisteria sings her... Hebrew song in Psalm 121, she's singing this word, shamar. That is to watch, to keep, to preserve, to protect. In fact, its meaning is so varied 
that when we talk about these angels being sent, being commanded, custody or care, I want you to also think they are not there to remove the stones. You know, the next verse says, in case you dash your foot against the stone, they're not there to remove the stones. They are not your stone removers. And we have all kinds of crazy ideas of what the angels will do. Oh, they'll come and they'll, they'll, they'll dust the road and they'll clean the way. It doesn't say that. It says simply to watch, to keep, to preserve. In fact, I'm sure a lot of us go day to day and we don't know the protection that God has provided for us. We have no idea. I just, I can tell you through the week the things that happened to me or the things that I've seen, and I know full well had God not had that heavenly host, what might have been, what could have happened. Now, there are plenty of examples in the Bible of God saying he will send his angels before. I know you know this one as a congregation. Exodus 23 speaks of God sending his angel before. We call it the first fruit angel, the promise of the first fruits. If you'll do your part, God says he'll send an angel before you to bring you into the place he's prepared. That, for the children of Israel, would have been the land of Canaan, the promised land, which is not heaven unless you want to go where the Amalekites and the Jebusites and the Perizzites and every kind of other ites are, it's not heaven. But for us in the now, that angel that goes before us is a type of the life of faith and promises obtained. We keep reaching for a new promise. We keep reaching for a new promise. So I'm hoping this will add some color to some of those promises you already know. Psalm 34 talks about the angel of the Lord encampeth around them that feareth him. And that doesn't mean you're scared. It means a reverential awe that you're, you're still looking to him. And so we've got protection and guidance. Uh, we've got these heavenly watchers, if you will. And they are keeping us in all of our ways. You mean our ways? No. I mean the ways that you've proclaimed through verse 2, that God is your stay, faithing, if you will. Okay? This promise, please don't say you're going to go claim this promise if you're not ready to say you are acting in faith. That's basically the sum total of verse 2. So, I'm going to put this all together, and we're going to actually put this thing in motion now. Because in one of the dictionaries, I read the meaning of this uh, protecting us, guarding us, preserving us in all of our ways are to the pious, to the elect. Well, it doesn't say anything about that. It just essentially, I'm going to put in my own words, it's to the faithing ones. And sometimes the faithing ones step out of line. Now, I can't say that enough because I'm so tired of these perfection folks that come at you and they say, well, you know, if you were really doing what you're supposed to do, you wouldn't be where you are. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that with us. <laughs> so, I'm going to show you, by example, what this promise translates into in a strange way, in a way that you wouldn't think of to get the point across. Remember, the command of God is not necessarily a law, but a spoken word in covenant that God gives an order to his children, to his prophets, to his saints, to abide by. So, to paint the picture of all this, go to Numbers. I'm going to navigate this one so well, you're going to be so surprised. Numbers 22. And some of you who know that passage are saying, oh, wow, goody, 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 goody. Um, Balaam's creature for today's message is called Jenny. That is a female jackass. <laughs> that is the correct terminology, all right? And she, by the way, it is a female. A God's sense of humor. All right, Numbers 22. And just to set the scene for what has just happened, um, Moses and his band 
uh, sometimes obedient, disobedient, obedient, are now forging towards that land, that not yet promised land. They're on their way there. And the uh, enemy, if you will, he comes across as an enemy now, uh, sees this mass populace, the children of Israel, approaching. And uh, this is pretty much where the story picks up in Numbers 22. The children of Israel set forward, pitched in the plains of Moab on this side, Jordan by Jericho. Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Moab was so afraid of the people because they were many. Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are around us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. They're gonna, they are going to devour everything if we don't put a stop to them somehow. God's children. Balak and the sons of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers, therefore, unto Balaam, the son of Beor, to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there's a people come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and who, he whom thou cursest is cursed. And let me jump down, because Balak is going to send a group of men to approach and deliver a message to Balaam. And now I'm going to read from a slightly different translation. I'm going to read fr from the uh, interlinear, but NIV, at verse 7. Actually, I'm sorry, at verse, I would be at verse, uh, a people in your King James, different chapter and verse here. A people, verse 11. A people has come out of Egypt, they cover the face of the land, have now settled next to me. Now come put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps they, I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the country. For I know that those who you bless are blessed and those who you curse are cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. They brought money to Balaam. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them and I'll bring you back the answer the Lord gives me. So they stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? I love the, the way this is narrated, as if God has to ask, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come, put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. I want to tell you something. This is the miracle of God's long suffering. You who read and study the Bible, you know by now how much stuff they've put God through. And he still says, you don't curse them. Now, God might curse them and kill them, but you don't. I like that. God says, this, this, this is my deal. Don't meddle. Next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak's princes, Go back to your country, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite princes returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other princes, more numerous, more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and they said, This is the message from Balak, the son of Zippor. Don't let anything keep you from coming to me, because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. Doesn't take no for an answer. Balaam answered them, Even if Balak give me his palace filled with silver and gold, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now I want you to hear that in here, that command is the same word I just shared with you. That's just God saying, This is what you do, or this is what I'm saying. Now stay here tonight as the others did, and I'll find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night, God came to Balaam and said, Since 
these men have come to summon you. I'm actually going to jump back into the King James at verse 20. I'm a uh, duolingualist here in translation. God came unto Balaam at night, said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall sing unto thee, thou shalt do. Now Balaam rose up in the morning, saddled his jenny, I see this is going to be tough. You know, it says ass in the Bible, but uh, I know on the replay a lot of folks don't read King James. Never mind, that'll hit you later too. <laughs> Actually, while I was reading the King James and some program was playing, somebody called in and asked, what language is she speaking? Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his jenny. He went with the princes of Moab. You're never going to forget this message, I guarantee you. God's anger was kindled because he went, and the angel of the Lord, and I want you to just stress this in your brain here, the angel of the Lord stood in the way, the way, the path that he was on, for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his jenny, to pause there, and his two servants were with him. And the Jenny saw the angel of the Lord, that was close, standing in the way. And his sword drawn in his hand. And well, this is going to sound good. Jenny turned aside out of the way. It's going to sound better when I say he beat his Jenny rather than the ladder. Never mind. Try and stay with me. I'm trying to navigate this. Balaam smote Jenny. I know you want to laugh too. I, I can't help it. To turn her into the wave. The angel of the Lord stood in the path of the vineyards, a wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And Jenny saw the angel of the Lord. She thrust herself into the wall, crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. The angel of the Lord went further, stood in a narrow place. There was no way to turn either to the right or left. And when the Jenny saw the angel of the Lord, that was close too, she fell down under Balaam. Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote Jenny with a staff. You are never going to forget this message. The Lord opened the mouth of Jenny, although I'd like to say, it, I just have to say it, the Lord opened the, the mouth of the ass. She said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? Balaam said, Because thou hast mocked me, and there were a sword in my hand, for if, if I had a sword, I'd kill you. And she said unto Balaam, Wow, this is good navigating. Am I not your Jenny? You're either going to think of this message and say, I remember that, or you're going to say, I have no idea what she's saying. <laughs> upon, yeah, Jenny, upon that which has written ever since I was thine unto this day. <laughs> was I ever one to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. And then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. He saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with his sword drawn in his hand. He bowed down his head, fell flat on his face. And by the way, that's what... All of these people, that's what happens when they see the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord said to him, Wherefore hast thou smitten your Jenny these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee because, listen, this is what I want you to catch, all kidding aside, because thy way is perverse before me. Now, I want to tell you what's so remarkable. Balaam, he says to the angel, I've sinned. I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. But I want you to see something. When the angel says, your way, thy way is perverse before me. And this angel, by the way, was sent specifically to do one of two things. We know that had the creature underneath Balaam not been obedient to bow down at seeing this figure, which she could, be, she could see some figure with a sword ready to kill. 
had that creature not bowed down, he would have been killed. But rather, this angel was sent to get him back in line. And I want you to see that because a lot of times we think, well, it's only these absolute obedient people. But in Balaam's mind, you see perhaps the, the sin of disobedience or the sin of not listening completely to God's command. And all I'll say to you is that the same concept is applied except this, we're not given an angel with a sword. We're given a heavenly host that is watching. And I want you to stress this word right here. In all of our ways, that is our walk, our, our pilgrimage in the faith. So I painted the picture of Balaam with the intention to show you the complete opposite of what happens when you get out of God's way and you begin to go your way, which is the definition of sin. And God still sent a messenger. Now, I know what automatically the mind will run to, but that's the negative side. That's right, I gave you the negative to show you that even in disobedience, God still had an invisible host. And by the way, Balaam could not see the angel of the Lord immediately because his eyes were blinded by his sin. I remember teaching on this many years ago. We had a service in the chapel, and I remember thinking to myself, the reason why he could not see, and the reason why many times we can't see, we're blinded by our sin. Our eyes become dark, and we don't have the ability to perceive what's around us, what God has given us. So, like the angel, on the complete polar opposite of what I've just told you, let me give you angels that are given on the good side. As I just gave you kind of a pejorative picture, let me give you angels on the good side, and then I'll be done. Through the Bible, through the Old Testament, we encounter angels appearing to people very much to guide them and direct them. In the case, for example, of Manoah and his wife, that would be Samuel's mother and father. She came before the Lord. She was barren. And she had a great complaint before God because she was barren. And the angel of the Lord spoke to her. Catch this because it's very subtle. Spoke to her and said she would have a child. Only that when she has this child, she's to commit him to God. He's to be a Nazarite. She is not to drink strong drink. She, the angel gives the instruction to keep her in the way. And this way had to happen for I'm sorry, for Samson, not Samuel, for Samson to be born. So we have angels coming to the aid. They're not preaching necessarily, but they're announcing and giving encouragement. We have angels coming to those in the Old Testament, for example, in the book of Zechariah. I'm bombarding you with the concept so that when you leave here today, you'll say, wait a minute, I'm the house of God too. By faith, Christ is formed in our heart by faith. I'm the house of God too. This promise of Psalm 91 is given to me and to you. Not just these other people in a book that some might just think is prose and poetry, but given, given to us for a purpose, to help us in our way. Not our way generically, like any way we want to go, but to remain anchored in the faith. I just referenced Manoah and his wife because had that angel not come, perhaps... Manoah's wife would have gone away very grieved, not knowing the promise that God was going to give to her to honor her faith. The same thing is true of Zechariah when he stands before the, in Zechariah, the high priest Joshua, clothed with dirty garments. Satan comes to accuse. An angel of the Lord speaks in defense, taking that approach of defending and the charge is given, remove those dirty garments, put on clean ones. So God is always offering these voices of encouragement. We're not, we're not guaranteed uh, experiences like some seek to say, well, I, I'd like to have a, a, a prison breakout experience like Peter did, you know. be locked away and uh, God's going to send an earthquake and the doors are going to open. And the angel's going to say, do not be afraid. I'm sure, I'm sure the angels spoke like that, too. They spoke King James English, don't you know? <laughs> but my point is to say, if we take this promise 
and begin to make an application to it, you almost have to stand back, and I, I, I say it first for me, in awe, because I've made God my anchor. Now, do we remain 24-7 uh, with that staying power in Christ? The answer, unfortunately, is no. If we're re remotely true with ourselves, we don't always stay that way. But when we come back to the Word and we make that our anchor, God says, I've got this host over here. By the way, they haven't aged. They're still as strong. Their bodies are not decayed. They're created. They're not fallen. These fighting forces, I call this, in the heavens, it's God's strategy room for the saints. Angels are gathered. And I, I'm giving you now my idea, which is just kind of a picture idea. There must be a strategy, like a war room, a strategy. And these are assigned over here, just like Satan has uh, areas and territories that he controls. These are sent. God is saying, you, angels, go. Go to my saints. Go, watch, preserve, take care, and help them in their way, in their walk, in their faith journey. And man, without divulging too much, I think at least one family in this church may have needed this word and this promise between last week and this week of an invisible host coming and being there for a calamity that could have been so grave and yet it wasn't as bad as it could have been. You know, I think we all have those events where it's not as bad as it could have been. We might just reduce it to, oh, you were lucky. Yeah, good luck. You know, it could have been worse. Yeah, good luck. No, God has sent his protective forces, his agents around you to encompass you. The minute you start acting as though that is true, you will be like Elisha when the Syrian leader sent his army to Dothan to attack and he and the servant, Elisha, are in that room. And the, the servant comes out and he says, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. And that prophet says, don't worry. There are more with us than with them. Somebody had some idea. I would say the prophet was truly right because the eyes were opened. And at that moment, that faith welled up. The invisible host became visible, and the servant looks out and sees a great host. God's just waiting for you to activate your faith. Now, I don't know that he's going to put out the neon lights for you and do some great thing where you go, wow, I saw it. But activate the promise that because you have said, this is the God I serve. God said, you're not going to be an orphan. I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm not going to abandon you. He promised he'd never leave us or forsake us. So you take this and you say, you know what? God said he'd send his angels, not just send them willy-nilly. He gave a command. My saint over there. My saint over there. He knows, by the way, he knows your name. He knows my name. He knows how to send these directly to us in our hour of need. And I don't believe we have to beg and petition. We simply have to ask in faith and claim this promise that while claiming it, the Lord has already made his word come to pass, the promise of these encompassing us. Now think about, put, put all this into play now. The next verse says, they'll, what? They'll carry you. They'll remove the stones. They'll uh, sweep the way. What does the next verse say? Does it tell you that they're going to make it comfortable for you? Does it tell you how smooth the ride is going to be? They shall bear thee up in their hands. Yeah, angels have hands, I guess, too. I really want you to make this a reality today, not... Uh, not something where you say, well, that's a good word, and I'm slightly encouraged. Why don't you take the time to go through this book and find every single reference that you can 
to angels coming to aid both old and new, clear into the book of Revelation, and then come back and tell me next week, I don't think there's angels given to me. Because I'll probably say, oh, come on, to take you on on that. There's more references to God assigning that helping host. For what purpose? Tell me. But to help us home. To help us in the way now. To keep our way. To remain that faith walk. To keep us and get us home. I like the, the Latin is great. That word for custody at least gives the idea that when a child is not necessarily able to do for themselves the state can ward custody and award custody so that this individual who's not capable is taken care of. God's not saying we're not capable. He just says, I know you might need a little help. I've given you this promise. There's one thing you must do. You've got to claim it in faith and say, that's mine. God gave it to me. Now I'm activating it. And believe you me, if you believe in the promise of him sending an angel before you, that first fruits angel we talk about, at the beginning of the year. Don't think he's just given it for one time, like it's a one-time event. All year long, one criteria. Verse 2 says it all. My God, my refuge, my fortress, in him, not in anything else, but in him, I'll place my entire being, and then I'll wait. I'll do exactly what all the psalmists declare. I'll wait on the Lord. I think for the family I referenced, and I will keep them in prayer, and for those of you that I don't know what you've been through, I sure know it brings me comfort to know in the times when I have been silly enough to think that I'm alone, and I know we have the promise of His Spirit with us, but in the times when we've all done this, where we're silly enough to think that we're alone, that we have nobody with us, I want you to remember, if you can't muster anything else, remember Psalm 9111, that is your 911 to say, Lord, I need help. And you watch and see if you, by crying out to him and making him your stay, he won't command his angels and say, go right now to help. It takes your faith and your faith alone to activate that promise. That is my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.